he just told me how to say his last name. I'm going to butcher it. Would you please, um, we're here, although it's not a snowy summer or snowy season this year, right? We have a total dearth of snow in the area. We are very happy to have author Jim Far, Farfaya, who has a new book. This is not your first book, but it's Historic Snowstorms of Central New York, which we do have on sale, and he will be signing. We have stickers and everything. Would you please welcome on stage. I'm going to run in the back because we are Zooming to people at well, and so I'm doing two or three things at once. So thank you for bearing with me. I'll give him a hand. Thank you. I prefer to stand if that's okay. Is that all right? Otherwise, if I sit, I'll fall asleep because this is my nap time usually. <laughs> Patrick, do I just click the next? Let's try it. There we go. Okay. Thank you for being here. So um, when they booked me for this program, uh, January 21st, you know, I live in Oswego County, up probably 25 miles north of Syracuse in a place called Fulton. And I'm like, well, if it's not snowing, I'll be here. Well, as Patrick mentioned, we're having a pretty mild, pretty mild winter here. I'm a snow lover, so I need that one good snowstorm before we get to spring. So I'm hoping, I don't know about you folks. So why did I write a, a book about historic, historic snowstorms of central New York? As Patrick mentioned, uh, I've written a few books, and my second book was a, voice, a book called Voices in the Storm, and it was from the blizzard of 66, and I know, see people nodding their heads. <laughs> Some people remember that blizzard. I was 10 years old, living outside of Fulton with my family, and I had a few memories of that blizzard. Most of them, you know, the school, no school for a week, and sliding off the roof of our ranch house with my brother. Um, and I, I like to research local history. I like to interview people. So I just got this idea. I wonder if people, other people have memories from the blizzard of 66. Well, all I had to do was put out a little email and, and Facebook, and I got, pardon the pun, buried with responses, buried with responses. 200 people told me stories of their memories of the blizzard of 66. And if we have time at the end, you might have some to share with me. And so I wrote this book, Voices in the Storm, and I started doing programs about it, just like I'm doing for you today. But this was specifically about that blizzard. And wouldn't you know it, every time I went out and did a program, somebody raised their hand on the, at the end and said, I got a story for you. <laughs> and some, some of those stories were as good as the ones that I found to put in the book. So I started keeping track of those. And they started sending me photographs. Let me make sure I know where my arrow is here. Okay, so first of all, this, uh, and, and none of these photos are Photoshop. These are actual photos, okay? This photo, this photo is from Oswego, New York, and it actually became the front cover of the Blizzard book. Let's go back there real quick and see, whoops. So if you can see, I took the right-hand part of this photograph to center in on that little child that's walking. You can sort of see a little dot. That's a little child walking. And in my mind, I was thinking, um, you know, what it must be going through that child's mind walking through those streets. But that's in the city of Oswego in a place called Liberty Street. And that was right after the storm was done. And I started getting more photographs from people. This one's from Newark, New York, uh, and did a program down there. And the gentleman said, I've got a picture for you from the blizzard of 66. So I like this, this picture because somebody's behind that man taking the picture and he's opening his garage door and that's what he sees, right? He says, I've got to shovel that before I can get anywhere. That's another picture from the same scene. Uh, and I like it because for two things, I like to show the perspective of the car. So that that snow drift was literally over his car, right? And the other thing is if you can make out the texture of that snow where it's been shoveled, many people told me, and you might remember this, these were not light snowflakes that got settled. This was blizzard wind 
smacking those snowflakes together and making it concrete like people told me they didn't really shovel they chiseled right they chiseled with like an old barn shovel to you know get rid of that snow so this was a major cleanup storm this is from sandy creek and i just like this for the perspective that's probably a teenager right there so you can see the size of that these are all blizzard of 66 pictures Okay, let me go back a second. So, um, and then the other thing that happened during my programs on the blizzard, some people would come up to me and say, no, you wrote, you wrote around about the wrong storm. 1958 was the big blizzard and 1947 was the big blizzard, you know? So I'm listening and I'm taking notes and that got me thinking, how far can I go back in history to research central New York snowstorms? I was able to go back pretty far, all the way to the 1700s, believe it or not. Um, there wasn't a lot of settlements back in the 1700s, but there was still snow here and there were still some people. And we're going to tell about some of those. But um, so after I decided I was going to write a book that focused on major snowstorms as far back as I could go, I started doing research. And I just wanted to show you how I do my research. So the bigger the font, the bigger the size of the letters, just the more important it was to my book. So you can see newspapers were the most important thing. If I'm going back to the 1700s, 1800s, there's nobody around today that's going to remember that. So newspapers were available to me. One of the things, I don't know if you're a history buff or, or if you're interested in, in history, but the old, old newspapers were just, they're just gems because reporters wrote almost stories because remember, there wasn't a lot of photographs. So they had to kind of tell what they saw. So I really got a lot of my information on firsthand accounts of those storms from newspapers, books. Um, I wanted to educate myself in meteorology. I'm not a science major. It wasn't a strength for me, but I was interested in about how lake effect happens. So I read a lot of books on meteorology, interviews. I interviewed about 70 people. Okay, so I shouldn't move then, right, from here? <laughs> Okay, uh, interviews about 70 people, uh, folklore. Um, I, people tell stories, but if they couldn't verify it and I couldn't verify it, then in the book I call it folk folklore so that I'm not spreading new rumors around. But some of those folklore stories are pretty good. And then journals and diaries. People, a lot of people used to keep journals and diaries way back when, farmers especially, because farmers needed to remember, now when did I plant those peas and corn last year? So we had a lot of diaries that I could use. And then letters, people wrote letters. Uh, lots of people wrote letters from, you know, if they lived in central New York and hit, got hit by the blizzard, they'd write a letter downstate or to another state and explain it to them. And then meteorological papers. The other thing, it's not, an, it's not important that you can see all those little words in there, but maybe you can. But um, one of my goals was, because I'm from Oswego County, my first couple of books were pretty much uh, Oswego County based, Onondaga County, Wayne County a little bit. But I really wanted to spread my wings and try to reach out. I reached out to places like the Oneida County History Center. By any re And by any chance, is there a woman named Janice Riley or Janice Riley here? Janice, hello, nice to meet you. Well, this lady helped me so much with my Oneida County history. Please, let's give her a round of applause for doing that. Uh, so... Kind people like Janice uh, answered my request from all over central New York, and I started gathering stories uh, to tell. So what I do in the book is at the opening page, I show all the towns, cities, little hamlets listed. There's over 100 here that are featured in the book in one way or another. Now, I don't know. This is probably too far uh, away from Syracuse. Does this face familiar with anybody? Jim Teske? Jim Teske is the medi chief meteorologist for News Channel 9. So uh, I wanted to make sure my meteorological facts were correct. So I just sent an email to Jim out of the, you know, crossed my fingers and said, I've written a chapter of my book about Lake Effect Snow. Would you mind reading it and, and commenting? He's such, such a nice guy, and he was glad to read it. He gave me some suggestions. And then <laughs> he told me his story of how he fell in love with snow as a 10-year-old growing up outside of Syracuse in a little hamlet called Fremont. So I've got Jim's story in the book too about, you know, I've met a lot of meteorologists in my uh, research. They all love snow. So he, they, and, they and I have something in common. 
One of the things I've realized in my, writing my books is that my books don't always stay in central New York. People tell me, oh, I sent your book to my sister in Florida or my brother in Texas. So I had to think before I wrote this new book, I need to explain a little bit about the phenomenon of lake effect snow. And you're, you may be familiar with it, but really quickly, you know, lake effect snow is generated from the Great Lakes. Uh, one of the things I didn't realize, we heard a little bit about this in that Buffalo storm recently that sometimes we get lake effect from Lake Erie, right? Depending on the direction of the wind. But what I didn't realize is we sometimes get lake effect from all five Great Lakes. And they have a fancy name for that, but I call it the Polar Express right over those. And, and look where it ends. If the, if the wind's coming from the north and the west, it's going to go across Superior and then end up Lake Ontario, and then central New York, it dumps all the snow there. So we really are kind of famous for our snow. Through my research, I kept seeing in my mind this image of a snowflake, right? I'm learning about how lake effect snow works. And I kept thinking to myself, these mounds and mounds of snow are made by little tiny snowflakes. And because I wanted to tell the story of how lake effect works, and I'm a storyteller, I decided to tell it through the voice of a single snowflake. So the second chapter of my book is, is a story of how lake effect works. Um, and before I tell you a little bit more about that, most of us think of snowflakes in this pretty image, right? You know, six pronged, but here's a real lake effect snowflake. <laughs> okay. So actually it's several lake effect snowflakes and the bigger chunk or the bigger glob, we'll call it in the bottom center, that's one snowflake and it's about an inch long. And so you might know from lake effect snow when you get it, big fluffy flakes coming down here. And some of them are pretty big. Some of them are as big as a quarter. But one of the reasons that is, is when the snowflake leaves the clouds and it comes down, it does something called branching. They connect to each other and they somehow unite. And that's what makes them sometimes as big. So here I want to tell the story of lake effect snow. So I called my snowflake Terry in honor of Lake Ontario, right? And, and it's the lake effect snowflake. So in, in the book, I go through the whole cycle, starting with a little drop of water in Lake Ontario, and then rising up to the clouds and back down. And that's, and that's the story of Terry the Snowflake. So uh, I wanna go through a little bit of history for you here. Now, I, uh, Patrick already told me that some people might recognize this person that's on the screen right now. I didn't know this before I did my research, but this is Colonel Marinus Willett, and he was a colonel in the United States Army uh, during the Revolutionary War or back in the 1700s, and uh, Colonel Willett was stationed in Fort Herkimer. Is it still called Fort Herkimer or no? Does he have a different name? It's in, in Herkimer area. This Is there still a fort around here? Does it have a name? Fort Stanwich, okay. So in my research, it was called Fort Herkimer. And he was stationed there with his team of men. And uh, General George Washington, soon to be our first president of the United States, this is in 1783, uh, I don't want to say asked, he uh, ordered Colonel Willett to uh, march his, uh, march his uh, men up to Fort Oswego, which is now called Fort Ontario. So if you've been up to the Oswego area, it's right on the port there uh, where it meets Lake Ontario. And there's a postcard that kind of shows where the fort is. Why did he do that? Because Fort Oswego was controlled by the British and General Washington wanted to overtake that fort and so that the Americans or the soon-to-be Americans could have control of it. So this is a, a February 9, or 1783. Colonel Willett marches about 200 men from Fort Herkimer to the Oswego area. Over 100 miles, February, freezing. Oneida Lake was frozen. They walked right across the lake and they were going to surprise the British in a midnight ambush. They got close to Oswego and they, because the area was so uncivilized, they brought in a Native American guide who knew the area really well. And uh, the guide was moving them closer to Oswego, and they got uh, within four miles of Oswego, and the Native American guide stopped. Guess what happened? Snow. 
They hit lake effect snow, major lake effect snow. Now, uh, so much that this guy said, I don't know where I am. And so that's the, that was how powerful that storm was. Colonel Willett had a decision to make. He could either uh, try to wait one more night. They were going to try to do a midnight uh, ambush, so they'd have to wait another full day. In the meantime, they'd run out of food. His men were starting to have frostbite. Um, conditions were terrible. Or they could turn around and go back, which is what they ended up doing. So I start that. I start my book by that story because I show the power of lake effect snow. It was powerful enough to change the course of our uh, attempts to win control of, of that fort and, and to win the war and become a freedom from the, from the English. And so that's the, that's the opening story. So I'm gonna move ahead chronologically. I'll go a little quicker here with some of my stories uh, to tell you some of the things that I was able to research about central New York. The next storm I talk about, uh, or the next year I talk about is 1816. It's called the year without a summer. I did not know about this till I did my research. You may have heard about it. I, I tend to call it the 1816, the year of winter. What happened in 1815, a volcano erupted in Indonesia and it spewed ash into the atmosphere all over the earth. And it clouded the earth so bad. This is an artist rendition of that, of what happened. It clouded the earth so much, crops could not grow. And uh, people were at risk of not surviving. Now, why would I put this book, this story in my book about central New York? Because I was able to uncover a diary from a woman from Cayuga County during this year. Well, it was several years of the diary, but including this year, she and her farming family tried to survive this, this year. And it's devastating to hear about, you know, ice storms in July, frozen ground in June. Uh, that sort of thing all through the season. So uh, that was a major storm. And, and being able to hear her voice through her diary really brought home the effect of that, that storm or that, that devastation. I wanted to include at least one storm story about lake storms, about ships on the lake, because, uh, you know, um, one of the things I realized in my research, most ships over the years, uh, insurance, if they want to get insurance to cover them safely, they will not insure their ships that go out on the lakes from November to April um, because it's just too unpredictable. So, uh, but some captains and some people may be trying to get one more ship load in before the bad, bad season begins, sometimes venture out on the lake. And this happened in 1880. I uh, worked with a woman named Susan Peterson Gately and I mention you name, her name because if you like uh, books about Lake Ontario, ships, disasters on the lake, she's written extensively on that. And she gave me permission to talk about one of her stories, which is about a ship trying to come into the Oswego Harbor during a November snowstorm. And you would think, you know, getting into the harbor would be safe, but that lake effect snow was actually coming through the city of Oswego and then out into the lake. It prevented that uh, ship from getting in here. Thankfully, nobody perished during that storm, but it, the ship was no longer usable after that. One of the things Susan mentioned to me, there are, she estimates 230 ships at the bottom of Lake Ontario that have, that have uh, you know, uh, been devastated through storms. Huh. So we get a lot of snow up here in central New York. Um, some people can relate to this picture. Some people... Uh, this is from a Tug Hill area up north, but uh, one of the things that impressed me in both my Blizzard of 66 book interviews and in my new book interviews is the snowplow drivers, the people that tried to keep our roads open during the lake effect storms. And uh, one of the things that I learned, uh, especially going back in history, is that we're so used to seeing the modern snow plows today, the big mammoth snow plows that have no trouble breaking through that. But back in the old days, that's not what we had to use. Okay, this was more the type of uh, storm that we have. Now, this picture is from Mexico, New York. These are the kinds of, it was basically trucks, maybe some slightly bigger vehicles that are trying to get through some of that heavy snow. This snow, this one is from, 
up in Richland area, Sandy Creek area. This guy's just plain stuck, right? Um, and uh, frustrated. So probably waiting for another truck to come pull him out. So I'm gonna go to, uh, okay. Okay, so uh, what I wanna do next, so when I did my research, Patrick said, hey, have you seen this video on YouTube? Anaya County, Anaya County snow plow during the 1947 storm. He sends me the video, it's fascinating, or sends me the link to it because it's on YouTube. And uh, I asked him permission if I could take a couple minutes of the video to share with my groups. Well, lo and behold, the person who made that video is here today, Ernest, Ernest Portner, Ernest Portner. And uh, I was telling Ernest, uh, this is the highlight of my program for a lot of people when I do my program, because we're going to see live video of a 1947 storm right here in Oneida County. We're going to hear Ernest talk. We're going to show about two minutes of the video. And uh, just a couple of things that I like about this is uh, I, I, you don't see a lot of footage during blizzards. Most people go out and take their pictures after the storm has passed because they don't want to venture outside. Um, and then also earnest commentary. So we're going to be able to hear him talk about what we're seeing. So Patrick's going to get us set up here and we're going to watch a couple minutes. I got to refine this. Don't take a second. You can learn how to find this yourself. That's okay. Besides Ernest, has anybody ever been in a snow plow, plow or had the opportunity to, yeah. Chunky, frozen snow. Hard stuff to move. There we are up on Boardman's Hill on 69. This was a storm of 47. About 12 feet of snow in there. This is our old Lynn we had. We used the rotary in there to widen it back. This is on the road to Tabor. There's probably 10, 12 feet of snow in there. That's been plugged for two weeks. This is a storm of 47. You didn't have to back up with that Lynn. She pushed right through. You didn't need any heat in there either. The, the guy driving it to sweat would be rolling right off of right in the shirt sleeves. This is out on the West Milan Road. This is 47. The last year we plowed, uh, we had a pretty bad storm there. This was the first rotary that the Nida County had, the first rotary plow. It didn't work out good because those paddles would break off. They'd go out to shoot, be like a, sending a missile out. <laughs> this was out by the O'Brien O'Brien Road on the Westland Road. This was the first first rotary the county had. That barn's long gone now. It was storming pretty good that day. I don't know if any of you remember the storm of 47, but it started snowing the 1st of March. The ground was bare. It snowed for two weeks, steady, night and day. And it snowed. It was heavy. And it plugged everything. They had to airdrop uh, food to people because you, you just couldn't move and the roads were plugged. This is still down on the west Round of applause for Ernest for that. Yep, that's right. So uh, just to add, not to plug our YouTube channel too much, but we put all our speakers up online and some get 50 views, 100 views, 200 views. Mr. Portner's video is at 27,000 views and growing. <laughs> There you go. Thanks. You're going to be an internet sensation. One of the things uh, 
and really I would advise uh, or not advise, I'd suggest you check it out on YouTube uh, before you leave, we can give you that information. But one of the things that I love that you said uh, was that sometimes, you know, accidentally snowplow drivers will hit a mailbox. And when they do that, the mailbox goes flying. They call that air mail. Fence post. <laughs> Well, thank you. It's just, that was just golden because uh, the other thing that brought to mind is um, there is an, if you also uh, are interested in the Blizzard of 66, if you go to YouTube and type in Blizzard of 66, Paul Cardinelli, I can give you that name later. He's got a really wonderful slideshow of some of those pictures that I showed you earlier, those tall uh, snowbanks. Paul's a friend of mine. He lives in Fulton, and uh, I, he helped me write that first book. And I said, Paul, these are great pictures, but there's all blue sky. And, you know, where's this, the blizzard? He said, Jim, if I tried to take blizzard pictures, you'd see a white screen. So, well, let's move on. So this is another Anoida County picture. This is from 1945. Janice, is, my, is it Janice or Janice? Janice, I'm sorry. Uh, this, I mean, you may have given me this one, or did you give me this picture? P Town of Paris, okay, 1945. So these are the kind of pictures I put in my book uh, as far back as I can go with photographs. And the 40s, 47 was a big storm, 45 was a big storm, so I illustrate that. But what I'm going to do now, we're going to move through this next part pretty quickly, so I'm going to give you a few other ideas of the type of stories that are in my book, and I'm going to use pictures to illustrate that. Now, the picture doesn't always match the story exactly, but I think the picture represents the story that I'm going to tell you. And I use this picture because, uh, well, let me put the, the other thing is I'm going to do headlines for you. You're going to see headlines on the screen, and I'll read them for you if you can't see the screen. But why did I do headlines? Well, when you do newspaper research, you start seeing headlines in your head in your sleep. You know, just you read so many headlines. So let's go to our first headline. And these are all uh, true stories, obviously. But February 1945, Cassville, Oneida County, school bus lodged between snowbanks, children trapped. Okay, so obviously that's not the picture, but picture a school bus instead of that plow. And the road was so narrow, the school bus could not move. Those kids were trapped in that bus. Now, thankfully... Everybody got out okay, but that's a pretty <laughs> scary experience for those kids and probably the bus driver too. That was a Lynn tractor? Right there. Okay. That's what you used. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay. Uh, again, picture doesn't exactly match the story, but it illustrates. January 1925, Syracuse, record-breaking snow collapses roofs, SU students hired to shovel. Okay, <laughs> so uh, I don't know if you can see the snowplow blade way in the back there, but it can take those young people a long time to shovel that free. <laughs> um, I guess those SU students probably liked having the day off of class, though. So um, I, I mentioned earlier to somebody I was talking to uh, that I have some stories from Fairhaven Beach State Park. Now, I know you're a ways from there, but are you familiar with the Fairhaven Beach? Some people are. Uh, this What we're seeing are the husband and wife that were the supervisors back. Uh, his name was Harold Northup. And Harold was the supervisor from 1938 to 1963. They live right there at the Fairhaven State Park. And he saw some major storms and he told me some, well, he didn't tell me, but I read his records and logs, uh, stories. But the story that I want to tell you goes back a few years earlier, still at Fairhaven. And the picture I'm going to show you is the actual picture that matches the story. December, January, 1935, 36, Fairhaven State Park, Civilian Conservation Corps comes to Village's rescue. So I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Civilian Conservation Corps. It was a a uh, program Franklin Delano Roosevelt started to put people back to work after the Depression. And there were crews all over the United States. There was a crew of 200 men stationed at Fairhaven during this time period. 
where they stayed year round. I don't know. There were no buildings back then, I don't think. Probably lean-tos, maybe tents. But they were there year round. And one of the stories that they told, and this is where this picture comes from, the village of Fairhaven literally was running out of food. There was so much snow that trucks couldn't get through. So they, they put this apparatus together, this sort of uh, machinery here in the front. And then behind it, you can't see where, where those people are sitting. There's a toboggan. And they pulled that to the next town over, Red Creek, got food, and brought it back to the village. Something that they probably didn't plan on doing when they signed up for the civilian corps, but they did. And one of the things that really amazed me was by the time they got back, it was dark. And somebody like that guy sitting there in the front had a flashlight, and that was their light so they could see on their way back there. Pretty amazing. Uh, February 1958, Sterling, which is in Cuga County, only three school days in February, girl views plow from top of power pole. Okay, now this again, believe it or not, that's not the picture from the story, but this is a picture from a similar experience, but I thought it illustrated. By the way, this woman that told me the story, she was upset that there was only three school days. She said, I was a Regents student and I was trying to study for Regents and I couldn't get to my classes. I don't think any other kids agreed with her besides that. But um, So I think most people were inconvenienced by snow, but I think there was one line of work where they might have liked the snow. What do you think of that picture? Ha, ah, wow. That's a, a man from Mexico who was with a phone company. He's fixing phone wires. Didn't need a ladder, just climbed up the snow man. Dece this is another picture that matches the story. December 1958, Oswego. Mayor needs dog sled to survey snowbound city. So uh, again, this is the actual picture. That's the mayor behind the sled. Those are Alaskan Huskies pulling his sled. It's the only way he could get around town to see what, where the crit critical areas were. Where the Alaskan Huskies came from, I don't know. Maybe people owned them back then. But April 1975, Fayetteville, five-year-old trapped in a well, rescued by dog. Every book needs a good dog story, don't you think? So um, let me tell you a little bit about the story. And again, the picture doesn't match the story, but I thought the innocence of the child in that picture kind of matched the, the crisis that was going on here. Um, first of all, let's look at the date, April, right? April's late for a snowstorm, but what had happened was heavy rains, heavy rains during April, and then cold front came through and dumped some snow. The girl was outside playing, she fell through a, wall, a well that had collapsed with all the rain, and the dog came to her rescue. Um, the rest of the story is in the book, but it, it's a good story. She was okay. January 1976, Adams, New York. That's up above Watertown. Town in running for snowiest place in America. One of the things, as I was telling somebody earlier, I don't have a lot of numbers in my book, you know, amount of snowfall. To me, after you read a bunch of numbers, it kind of all gets blends in your head. But this storm total stuck out in my mind because in 24 hours, Adams received 68 inches of snow. 24 hours. Uh, Buffalo uh, probably either matched that or surpassed it a couple of weeks ago. But uh, this was a different era in the 70s. Um, Adams was, they thought they had the, the, um, the uh, record in the books. But through a series of experiences, they didn't get it. And they were all upset. Colorado got the big, beat them by one inch. And they were all upset because they were going to send Colorado a consolation prize. It was going to be a box of cream cheese. Just, I'm not sure why, but. Um, so this picture, I will tell you, uh, it didn't come from the January 76 storm, but it came from a man named Bob Sykes. Um, anybody familiar with that name? Probably not. Bob was a meteorologist in Oswego, New York at the college. And during the blizzard of 66, he monitored the snowfall in Oswego. And you may have heard the, the famous amount of snow that fell 103 inches during the blizzard of 66. Uh, Bob took those measurements. He taught it, I mean, he taught meteorology. He taught uh, Al Roker, if you know Al Roker from the Today Show. He taught uh, Dave Icorn, who used to be in the Syracuse channels. So he taught some famous people, and he believed in teaching in the elements. He took his students out in the weather to teach them the weather. So um, here's one of his students trying to get an A in the class, I guess, just going out to measure the snow. 
let me tell you one good, uh, or excuse me, not good. Uh, maybe it's good. You'll tell me if it's good or not. Uh, one story that I heard from Al Roker. I did interview Al Roker. I had the privilege of interviewing him because I wrote a book about Bob Sykes as a meteorologist. Al, uh, you may not know this or not. Al was not a meteorology major in uh, SUNY Oswego. He was a broadcasting major, but he was interested in the weather and he took some classes. One of them was from Bob Sykes. And Bob used to take his students on the top of the college science building, three stories up on the roof. And if you've been to SUNY Oswego, it's right on the lake. And those storms come and they hit you full force. So one night, it was a night class. Al was up there with all the other students. Bob was teaching the class. And that wind is coming off the lake pretty bad. And Al told me, he said, I, I just couldn't stay. He said, so I kind of backed off and then I walked down the stairs quietly and I said to myself, I could never do this for a living. <laughs> so uh, one of the things I want to tell you is I end the book chronologically in 1980. So I, 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 I carry the storm coverage to 1980 and then I stop. Anybody want to take a guess why? Climate change, perhaps. Um, well, the, so we're, we're not getting the severe storms that we used to. I, maybe you'll agree with me on that. Um, but the other thing is we're a different world now. Prior to 1980, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have internet. We didn't have the weather channel, Doppler. It was a different way. And so the stories that I got after 1980 were not as dramatic. I like, I like stories that kind of pull at your heartstrings or that make you feel like, wow, are they going to survive this? And I'm not saying we still don't get, I mean, people perished in Buffalo and that was unfortunate, but nowadays we get usually pretty good predictions of when those big storms are coming in. Um, sometimes back in the old days, people didn't know when that snow came. So if you remember, I mentioned that people kept telling me stories about the blizzard of 66 after I had written that book. I started collecting them. I got about 100 collected. I took 30 of those Blizzard of 66 stories and put them in my new book. So these are new stories that weren't in the first book that I thought were superior in, in, uh, in terms of their dramatics. So I'm going to share a few of those with you now real quick with headlines. Nurse from New Haven. Now, New Haven is outside of the city of Oswego. Uh, hops a snowmobile to make her shift in Oswego. Dedicated nurse, right? She was supposed to make her shift, couldn't get in by car, too far away to walk on snowshoes, hops a snowmobile on her neighbors, uh, gets about halfway there, and then hops a Jeep with no floor in it. So pretty, pretty dramatic drive. Cato School's maintenance man drives unplowed roads to Pennsylvania for coal. So uh, I, I found this story in the newspaper. So schools were closed for students and teachers, but they had to stay heated or the pipes would freeze. And this gentleman, his job was to go down to Pennsylvania with an 18-wheeler, pick up coal and bring it back. And when he called down, the school was running low. He called down. He was told an 18-wheeler will not make it to Pennsylvania. The, the roads are just too narrow. So he got a little small truck. He got down there and got a smaller load and brought it back. So he was kind of a hero. Three or four weeks ago, I was telling this story in Sterling County, where Cato, near where Cato was, and a man raised his hand. He said, I was that man. <laughs> so I got to meet him. Just like meeting Janice today and Ernest, I, I just appreciate uh, being able to talk with him. So he told us a few more stories about that event. Fulton Teen carries food from his father's diner to the family home. So I'm from Fulton. So this story kind of appealed to me extra special. It was a little small diner. The family lived about three or four miles outside of Fulton, and uh, they were running out of food. I mean, this happened back then. If people were not prepared during these big storms, they would run out of food. And the teenage son happened to be in the city of Fulton, and his father got a hold of him uh, by telephone and said, you need to go to the diner and get some food and carry it to us home. Three or four mile walk. So the story of how he breaks into the diner, he doesn't have a key, right? So he breaks into the diner and then how he manages to carry enough food home for his family. It's a pretty amazing story. Sandy Creek boy describes total amazement after blizzard. One of the things I love doing is interviewing adults who were kids during these storms because the perspective is so different, right? You're young, everything looks bigger to you. And the way he described what he saw after the blizzard hit, it, he called it amazement. 
Camilla's college student breaks leg skiing, watches blizzard from hospital bed. So um, here's another one where just last week I was at the Marcellus Library. This woman showed up, uh, um, but I had communicated with her through email. So I kind of knew her at least through email. Here's the story real quick. It was actually her friend. Um, her friend broke her leg. Her friend was not from New York State. She wanted to learn how to ski. They decided to do it during the blizzard of 66. So um, she goes to the hospital. They can't get out because the blizzard hits. So they end up staying there five or six days. Uh, the woman told me that I had to put a little uh, uh, masking tape on my bed to say I'm not a patient. So they wouldn't wake her up in the middle of the night to take her vitals. So, but the, the interesting thing, the scary thing about it was, she said, as that snow mounted up the window, their hospital bed window, a crack went through that window. So pretty scary. Wayne County woman heading for SUNY Oswego braves blizzard of 66 in a 1958 Chevy. So, you know, I liked the hardiness of the story. The woman was traveling alone. It was dark, which it's, it's dark most of the day during that time of year anyway, especially during the blizzard. She said she had that uh, Chevy in second gear all the way to Oswego, but she didn't make it. Oswego County ham radio operators send relief to rural residents. One of the things that I realized, I always thought of ham radio operators as kind of a hobby, something you did in your den and, you know, sort of something you enjoyed. But prior to Doppler, pri prior to cell phones and internet, um, if those people in rural areas were stuck, they were stuck. And there was no way of identifying where they were if they needed help. Ham radio operators came to the rescue for those folks. Pregnant Liverpool woman hitchhikes to Fulton during blizzard to reunite with family. <laughs> so uh, this is one that I heard shortly after I, I published the Blizzard of 66 book. My next book after that, I wrote a book about Nestle Chocolate Factory, which was the uh, sort, of a, a sort of pride for the city of Fulton. We were the first milk chocolate factory in North America, not just the United States, Fulton was. So we had a hundred year history of you know, sweet chocolate memories. Anyway, this woman met with me. Her in-laws had worked at Nestle and she wanted to share some memorabilia and tell me some stories. She goes, hey, I heard you wrote a book about the blizzard of 66. And I said, yeah. She goes, I got a story for you. So here's her story. Just so I don't, I don't want you to think she's strange for going out when she's pregnant. Story was she had a two-year-old daughter, she and her husband. They dropped the daughter off at their in-laws in Fulton and then went back to Liverpool to go to a party. They were going to stay overnight, get up the next day and drive to Fulton to pick up their daughter. And the blizzard hit during the night and they were not going to be able to get their daughter. And I don't know as mothers or parents out there to be um, away from your child for that long. She said, I could not stand it. So I said to my husband, we're going to hitchhike there. So uh, they hitchhiked there and everybody was happy. Three months later, a little, little uh, snowflake child was born. One more uh, pregnancy story, but this one from Oswego Veterinarian Travels During Blizzard to Help Dogs Deliver Pups. 12-year-old Cicero boy caught in blizzards mini tornado. Now, there were not tornadoes during the blizzard, but if any of you recall or if you've been in blizzard storms, sometimes when that wind gets in between buildings, it starts whipping around. And uh, for some reason, this boy's father sent him out to shovel snow during the blizzard, maybe to get him out of the house. You know how kids can be. And uh, he got caught in that tornado-like feeling, and he described how scary that was. So this is my last story, and this is how I end the book. This is an actual picture of who I'm going to tell you about. Uh, William Bill Spalding. I was doing a program in Fulton about the blizzard, and at the end of the program, this gentleman, now much older, of course, stood up, and he told me this story. He said, during the blizzard of 66, I, six, I was stationed in Okinawa, Japan. He said, I had a day off and I went down to the camp commissary. I was going to buy a snack and I was going to look for an American newspaper just to catch up on American news. And he's scanning newspapers and all of a sudden he sees Oswego, New York on the front cover of a newspaper. And he says to his buddies, that's where I am from. And they are, oh, you're making that up. You're just making that up. And, and he said, no. And then he said to me, I wished I'd kept a copy of that paper, he said. So we exchanged email addresses. Well, three or four months later, he finds that newspaper <laughs> and here it is the stars and stripes you may be familiar if you did military service or you know someone who did it was a paper that was sent to 
uh, military overseas to keep up on American news. Look at the date on this paper, February 4th, 1966. The blizzard was a late January, very early February storm, and it made the front page. That's Oswego, New York on the front cover. So I end the book, and I'm going to end my program here today with you by saying central New York uh, snowstorms are world famous right? Uh, it's, they've been on Johnny Carson, uh, joked about them one time. Walter Cronkite talked about it one time on the night, nightly news. Um, so I think it's something I feel we need to be proud of. I don't know if you feel the same way, but uh, it certainly is world famous. So here's my book. Uh, one thing I wanted to explain, the first three books I wrote, I self-published those books. And when you self-publish, you have total control over your book. But when you start working with a publishing company, then it's a partnership. And I work with a company called Arcadia, the History Press. They're a wonderful company to work with, and they do local history is their specialty. But they choose the title of the book, and they choose the front cover. So, you know, I give them suggestions, but then I cross my fingers. And I love the picture they took. This is from another 1947 picture. That was a major storm. This is Perry Hill in Oswego, New York. And you can see the snowplow there. It's stuck. And then there's two shovelers <laughs> that are somehow trying to free this plow up. So I just thought it was a great, great picture. So I'm going to end my program there. And I want to thank you for being a great audience today. Thank you.